lost peoples of, of the Holocaust, but he also wanted to make sure that people understood that even if you didn't lose someone, this was part of our history, our collective history, our capital O U R history, our national history. Because in order to do that, in order to, to be able to prevent this kind of travesty from moving forward, we had to believe that this, whole, this story belonged to all of us. And so he began um, talking to people about what was, what was in the Texas public education system. And as many of you know, this is um, a very learned audience, you know, we're, we're discovering in 2018, right, that, that the history of the Holocaust, the memory of the Holocaust um, is becoming more faded, um, a little bit um, more uh, patina. So that in 2018, the New York Times actually reported that 31% of Americans and 41% of millennials believe that only 2 million Jews died in the Holocaust. Even worse, 41% of Americans and a full 66% of millennials did not know what Auschwitz was. We, 52% of those same people believe that Hitler came to power through force, through a military coup, not through completely legal that both Mussolini and Hitler came through historically um, uh, legitimate means and then consolidated their power and uh, began to throw off the messages of democracy. This is not just a uniquely American issue, however. Um, one, fully one third of Europeans know little of the Holocaust. The uh, Anti-Defamation League reports a 52% increase in anti-Semitic violence. This is a devastation. This is a, a, uh, an insult. And so what Pete Berkowitz wanted to do was to inform, to educate, to bring the Holocaust, to bring the story to all Texas high school students. And so he did this first by contacting the Institute of Oral History at Baylor University. And so he contacted the, the Institute of Oral History at Baylor University, and they started a project that was funded by the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission, where they located 19 liberators, 19 American soldiers who'd been there within two weeks of the liberation of certain concentration camps. And he did, he, he uh, funded, the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission, funded oral interviews with these people. And so,
to effectively get them to tell their stories, they are actually talking to them about other things that have happened, their background, how they grew up, when they uh, went over uh, to fight the Second World War, um, their comrades, their buddies in arms, and then they begin slowly teasing out the history of the Holocaust. And so Pete had already commissioned, the TH to HGC had already commissioned all of these interviews, and so they want to know, because they are four and a half hours long, they tend to be more technical information and documents for uh, scholars of the Holocaust or scholars of the Second World War, how they could actually bring this to children who were 11 to 18 years old, who might not want to sit through a four and a half hour interview with someone who looks like their grandpa, right? And so the, the, that was the challenge for us, was to figure out how it is that we, that we bring this to, to students who have a difficult time sitting down, have a difficult time paying attention, who are uh, teachers, who are tasked with teaching to teach or to star test. How do we bring this history in? And so Pete came to Texas Tech, and Pete had already done a lot of the groundwork, right? The THGC had already done a lot of the groundwork. Because what he discovered was that Holocaust education was part of the curriculum in European history. It was part of the curriculum in world history, but it was not part of the curriculum in US history, right? Many, for many students, European and world history are elective courses. They are not the required courses, but American history is required. And so he needed to find a way to bring the story of the Holocaust, to bring this narrative to the students who were required. Every single Texas high school student is required to take US history. How did he bring this narrative into the US history curriculum? So he went to the state of Texas. He talked before the coordinating board. And he was able to change the teaks so that, in fact, the, uh, the American narrative of liberation, of the American soldiers' experience as they were going through war, as they were embarking in Europe, and as they stood on the, at the front doors of, of Dachau, the gates of Dachau, right? That they stood not just as uh, soldiers, but they stood as witnesses to the Holocaust. They served a different purpose. Now, this is not to denigrate or to uh, limit or to minimize the historical oral histories that have been collected about survivors at all. This was what we call a portal, that if maybe a 14 to 18 year old could see that they were the same age as these men who were sent abroad, that they could have themselves also been witnesses, that these men answered two calls to duty, the first to fight the Second World War, and the second, 50 years later, to testify that the Holocaust existed and is undeniable, then maybe we could open the eyes, open the minds of children to begin to look further and deeper into the history of the Holocaust and begin to take into consideration that this is a history that doesn't just belong to one community or one people, but belongs, in fact, to all of us. So, he came to Texas Tech, and he asked us to create a digital book using some of these oral histories from the Institute of, uh, of Oral History at Baylor. And I am too much of uh, a, a wisecracker, and so I said to him, well, you know, a digital book, you mean like the one on Kindle where you go, <laughs> right? And I said, the, you know, these kids today, they're playing apps. Right? They are engaging with YouTube. They are doing all sorts of different things. This is not just going, is not going to be the thing that draws them in. And so I asked him if he had ever considered, because I'd just been in Italy and it was um, the World Expo in Milan, and they had developed this beautiful app about Leonardo da Vinci and his atelier. And I showed him the app and I said, we do not want to play the Holocaust. We do not want to animate the Holocaust. But can we find an educational tool that begins to introduce to students the ways in which we do history, the ways in which we bring oral testimony, document, artifact, survivor testimonials together so that they can see how a history is woven together by all of these different narratives, by all of these different texts. And so I said, you know, maybe what we need to consider instead of a digital book is actually a digital app. Now, when I had, I, I 
smart mouth them and, and told them that, I had not realized that I would have to create the app. Um, and I realized, you know, while I, I know how to download on iTunes, um, and I know how to download on App Store, I did, in fact, know nothing about programming. And so, in fact, this then became, and uh, there was a second layer to this where it was also about educating our students. So I actually had teams of students from the Honors College, from the College of Media Communications, from the Department of History, from the School of Art, from the Museum, and from the Department of English. We actually have awarded three PhDs, two MAs, and two undergraduate degrees based off of the Texas Liberator Project. This is, in my mind, integrated learning at its best. So from the English department, we actually had a writer, and we had um, someone who uh, did uh, testing on the efficacy of digital applications. School of Art gave us graphic designers. Um, School of Architecture actually gave us two PhD students. College of Media Communic Communication gave us Film crew, Department of History gave us history students, Honors College gave us museum studies students. And in this, as we start to build this, I said, well, if we're going to build an app, then we need to build a website. We can't put out an app that isn't contextualized. So we had to begin thinking about, as we were building this app, what it would mean. And we took to heart the driving mission, the words of Ellen Wiesel that for the survivor who chooses to testify, it is clear. His duty is to bear witness for the dead and for the living. He has no right to deprive future generations of a past that belongs to our collective memory. To forget would be not only dangerous, but offensive. To forget the dead would be akin to killing them a second time. So we didn't want to lionize the veterans. We wanted to use them as they saw themselves as they were coming forward, as witnesses to the Holocaust. And so we dedicated this to veterans, to survivors, to the people we lost, and we dedicated this to education. So the first step was to contextualize. How are we going to contextualize this? So one of the first things we did was, in fact, to have two of our architecture PhD students and the graphic designer reconstruct Dachau. We actually sent one of the students to Dachau and he met with the artists there. They looked at the blueprints. He came back with specs. He was not able to bring a measuring tape because all of this is actually built uh, to spec, but he, he didn't want to walk, wander around. It would have been disrespectful to wander around Dachau with a measuring tape, right? So he actually used his lens cap of his camera and went and measured the distance between the windows and the barracks. We wanted this to be as accurate as possible. We based this off of, um, let me see if I can get this to work, there we go. Um, we based this off of blueprints, we based this off of uh, witness testimonial, we based this off of visiting the space, we based this off of vintage and historic photographs, but we had to recreate Dachau. We recreated Dachau because it, uh, those of you who've been to Dachau know that not all the barracks are still up, but we wanted to even get the foliage right. We wanted to get the trees right. We wanted this to be a testament to what these people suffered. And so we began to create first the space. So all of this 3D imaging, 3D building was part of that had to be programmed then into our app so that students would get a sense of the enormity of Dachau. We chose Dachau as a space um, because it is very well known to our students. Um, Texas soldiers, Texas troops actually liberated Dachau, and so even though our testimonials are from uh, liberators who liberated other camps, we decided to use Dachau as the grounding feature. And then we had to create the website. Now, part of what we wanted to do was uh, make sure that we were honoring the history of the Holocaust to honor exact to, to honor. Um, to, to make sure that we understood that this was not something to play. This is not theater. This is real. This is history. And so we wanted to create a space in which educators, students, uh, the community could actually land on in order to begin to understand. So we created this, this website with Jake Wolfson, um, the educational director, to make sure that we, we got things as precise as possible, as detailed as possible. 
So everything from what the project was to a history of the Holo uh, a little brief description of the Holocaust to um, the commission and the liberators. But we want to make sure that this was going to be effective for, for people doing research. Again, our idea is this is a portal to further Holocaust studies. This is not a project to glorify veterans, even though we respect and we honor what they did. But they are not here to talk about the Second World War. They came back to talk about the Holocaust, to be witnesses to the Holocaust. So one of the first things we did was to actually uh, create an honor roll. At this point, and this is, this is, we're working on updating, oh, it's not showing up there. I'm looking at anxiety, thank you, sorry. <laughs>
because it'll run for 15 minutes of the app. But we also have an app user guide. And this user guide is for educators, it's for anyone who is going to interact and engage with the app that explains the purpose, explains the type of questions, explains why learning the Holocaust is important, goes through scene by scene to explain the purpose of the app, to explain the interactions, to explain the ways in which history is integrated into this educational tool for students to become more interested and more engaged in the study of Holocaust and genocide. And then we have, so you can either, um, I have a, a young gentleman here uh, in the second row who probably would very easily engage with the app. Um, and then we have other people who are still like me having to call the IT guy every time something goes wrong. Um, and so we also created a walkthrough where you can watch a video of someone else actually engaging with the app so that you can actually, so the educators can go back and forth and actually pull up the exact spot that they want to discuss in the classroom. So I'm going to show you just a little bit of this. Because I want to reassure you that we not only created a... Um, Wait. Yes. Somebody's here? Oh, sorry. I thought that was talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I but you can see the arrow is where the, the, the student would actually um, engage. And they would walk to the arrows and talk. So we made some because you created a narrative in which to then put in the different we videos and artifacts that we have. You can tell him that Brigadier General Henning Linden So you can see that they interact, they, they walk through the different design. arrows. We engage also with yes, the space and not have itself. I will be taking command until you are relieved. So let me show you, I'm not going to show you all of this, but so that you can see a little bit of um, the type of work that we're doing here. <laughs> We talk about the words on the top of one of the buildings of, of the camp. Then we intersperse every interaction that they have. They actually speak to um, speak to a different uh, liberator, and they actually hear it in their own words. But we wanted to make sure that this was not just the history of the liberator. So, working with the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, the Dallas Holocaust Museum, and the Holocaust Museum of Houston, we actually took survivor testimonials as well. And, and interspersed them in here so that they could tell the story through their own words. And so if this pulls up, um, you should have a survivor testimonial. Mueller, can you ask those survivors what they experienced here? One by one, most of them were dead, but I couldn't take one. And the one that the, the less they were alive, they put him in them and trucks and jeeps, and they took him to hospitals or they made tents and they put him in, they gave him water, they gave him packets from the Red Cross. This was bad too, because people, and they got on packages. There was a pound of milk, there was chocolate, there was a can of meat, and they were so hungry, they didn't care, and they ate. So, hundreds died from eating this stuff, because their stomach was no use to food. And, I had a guy next to me, I don't know if he was a doctor one or something, he was head of it. And he got the package. And I think he was on Gary and other men. He says to me, 
the liberators um, who we actually use. There were originally 19 that were interviewed by the Institute of Oral History at Baylor. We included two more from the Holocaust Museum in uh, Houston. Um, Robert Anderson, I used him as an example, and the way that the, it, it looks, right, we have a service photo and then we have his modern day portrait. So that students understand that when they were, that these men were sent to war, they were the same age. They were men. But that they have carried the story with them for decades. Bob Anderson was a professor at Texas Tech University. He was a professor of psychology. He was one of the original founders and researchers on dyslexia. But um, as one of my colleagues, Jim Brink, who was a former senior vice provost, said, uh, said to me when he knew that I was working on this project, that Bob Anderson, he's a misanthrope. He hates everyone, right? Um, and his students wrote letters um, because we were hoping that when this project launched, that he would still be alive so we could honor him. Um, but he passed the, the in July, and the, the exhibit actually opened at the end of August. When he, uh, we used his portrait as one of our promos. When his sons came back to Lubbock for his funeral, they rushed over to the museum because they saw this portrait of their father. And they came and they said, you know, Elisa, I, I think there's been a big mistake. My father has never been a prisoner of war. And I said to him, sir, your father wasn't a prisoner of war. He liberated prisoners of war. He went to his death without his sons ever knowing that he was a part of this, that he was a witness to this. But even though he didn't say anything to his sons, he actually was willing to sit down with the Institute of Oral History and talk about the experience. In Thionville or outside Thionville, which is a very lasting, uncomfortable memory. We didn't have a lot of heavy clothing. We were getting it gradually. But we had, as a wireman, you had to go out and you worked with your hands, so you had gloves. And I lost a glove. And there was no other glove, so I was without a glove. So we were parked on a road in the convoy. And I looked over there, and there was a whole pile of soldiers dead soldiers. They just lined them up on the road, you know, they, and then they were waiting for the mortuary trucks to come and pick them up. But they were mostly German soldiers. There was one American who was from our division that had before had been killed. So I went through those looking for gloves. I found a glove. I took from a young German soldier and on his belt he had God is with us. But but my thought was, Jesus, I've been praying to God all my life. <laughs> and he's my enemy. But the same thing. It didn't make sense. It didn't make any sense. Sense at all. We started seeing these people coming out from the trees, from the woods, and then getting in the road and getting in the way. And, and we couldn't run over them. I mean, you know, that's, that's not America. And then the, uh, over the radio, they told us that they had just found out that these prisoners had been released from a concentration camp and been released to get in our way and to slow our, uh, our path, uh, slow us down. Uh, and they did slow us down, but they would, uh, they would absolutely stop us and kiss the front of the tank or they'd salute us. It was I, you know, I couldn't help but cry myself. I, I had never seen anything like that. I couldn't understand, but. This is William Dippo. And William Dippo was uh, not alive when we wrote the book that I'll be talking about a little bit later. So this 
so we weren't able to get a modern day portrait of him. But he has my heart because um, he talks about what he saw, and I'm going to show you that small clip. But later on in the interview, he also talks about the fact that we have to keep fighting against genocides. We have to keep fighting against human cruelty. And when you see, see him, uh, you'll understand why he has such a place in my heart, because he talks about the fact that if there is genocide going on, he'd be the first to sign up. He would be the first to go. He'd be the first to fight against injustice if they had him. Well, you could hear. We didn't know. We didn't know. The stench of the ovens would have, you should have given it away, but it was, didn't even need that. It was obvious what was going on in that in, in close area. My house, it would go down as infamy, as man's worst in humanity to man. I saw this back black smoke going up into the sky. And some, I asked somebody, I said, what in the world is going on? And somebody said, they're burning the camp, or what's left of it. So I jumped in the ambulance and drove down there. And, and man, that was the blackest smoke I'd ever seen. And I know I wrote in my, in my account of it that, uh, it looked like the fires of hell. So what my students had to do was to take four and a half hours of video and find the right number of clips, right? That exact moment. And so he goes on after this, and we use this in the app, where he describes the fact that they actually rescued a camp of women. And as these American soldiers were trying to carry these women out, these women were scratching them and fighting them because they thought they were being taken to the crematorium. This is Wilson Canfax, and this was one of the big surprises uh, that we had in, um, in going through the footage. And I'll let you understand why we were so surprised by this footage. There was a young fellow who came up to me speaking perfect English. Uh, it looked like he was about 15 or 16 years old. He was too young to have been in the German army. And he said, I see you have cross on your lapel. Are you a chaplain? I said, yes. He said, could you think you could do us a favor? I said, well, I could try. It turned out that this person that was talking to me was the young fellow, Elie Wiesel. Uh, there have been documentaries on his life. Well, he didn't know me from Adam, and same thing. I just knew I was meeting a young fellow. And he says, could you do something for us? And I said, well, I'll do my best if I can help you. And he said, uh, first of all, I'd like to take you through some parts of the camp here. As you've heard the expression, dead men walking. That's where the people who were in the concentration camp looked. Uh, I went to several of them, some who could speak English, and I talked a little bit with them. I planned a worship service for them. A chaplain had many different things, ways to put things together. So I planned a Jewish worship service for those who wanted to come, wanted to, so many of them had wanted nothing to do with religion, but those who were genuine in their faith uh, and there was the opportunity to come to a worship service, they came. We got our carry-alls, those big trucks, and put people who could be carried in those things to a place where we could have a worship service. 
They had to be lifted on, they had to be carried on, uh, crying. Uh, they never thought they'd be alive. They were still uh, amazed and blank looks on their faces. That some of them, I'm sure, got on the carryalls and went not even knowing what was going to be happening. Uh, many of them had been there and not knowing too much about their past because they'd always been under some kind of care and, and concentration. I was in charge of the worship service. And we had some little prayer books that were uh, distributed among those who want, wanted them. And on one, one side of it was Hebrew, Hebrew prayers. The other side was English. So as they went through the service in Hebrew, then I could follow along in English itself. They cried, they shouted. When they got through, they just raised their hands, sort of like our Pentecostals today raised their They were just raising their hands in joy and appreciation. They didn't think they'd ever see that again. They didn't think they'd be alive. Maybe we are, in the course of time, only too recently out of the trees. Maybe there is a savagery uh, potential within uh, man. But unless that is curbed, we need to be reminded of what those excesses can produce. And the death of six million innocent people is... Uh, something that uh, we must not repeat. And this is Lee Burke, who's the father-in-law of one of our commissioners. And he only speaks of the Holocaust one time, and that's for this interview. In other words, we just, I mean, you had heard that these atrocities were going on. But you're young. You're, you're fighting a war, you're, and, but when you actually walk in and you see it and you smell it, it's just unbelievable.
The unimaginable emerges slowly, like a hungry dead. Education, what, is it, what are they called? Educational resource centers. 
the service centers. Um, we've been doing workshops. Um, we have had a number of press releases, talking to local media, and it is our hope that everywhere the exhibit goes, that the school teachers will bring their students and they will be able to pair these things up and create a much more holistic, much more comprehensive entree into Holocaust studies. And so um, we're doing everything we can to kind of push it out there. We decided not to, because originally the idea was to actually have it be a downloadable app. We actually put it on a website instead so that the entire Texas community, in fact, the entire nation, um, if you go to www.texasliberators.org, anyone can launch the app, anyone can access um, the educational resources because we want this to really be a portal for everyone to begin to understand that this is their history as well. Congratulations on just amazing, astonishing, I'm blown away. Um, did you do any user studies? What kinds of responses have you been getting from students? And so we had, so one of our PhD students was actually uh, you know, usability, uh, wrote his dissertation on the usability of the actual app. So we went to Midland High School, we went to all of the Lubbock ISDs, and we actually launched this. And a lot of the modifications that we did came from their feedback. Um, one of the difficult things that we are experiencing now, and so we're working on this with programmers, is of course um, the, uh, what do you call the server, right? If you have 30 students all on the same time trying to launch the app at the same time, some of them are using Chrome, some of them are using an Internet Explorer, some of them are using Firefox. They're trying to get it to work across all avenues has been uh, a little bit trickier than I had anticipated. But we have several student programmers, a student program, all of us, um, working on it. Um, and that student actually got a job at Microsoft and is working also at Microsoft now. Um, and so we're working on that. And that's probably been the most difficult thing. Students have been very um, engaged and responsive to it. So we've actually been receiving a lot of student letters, a lot of student projects. And what we're hoping, because the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission actually has a number of awards for students, that they actually begin to connect what they're doing with the app, what they're doing um, in, in um, further research with the awards that are given out by the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission. I've actually had more than high school students, college professors actually contacting me because they are actually using this as the, uh, the starter project and then what they're doing is doing some of the projects that we have on our website, so oral history projects, um, the belt buckle project, talking about artifact, and really beginning to engage with kind of historical text and artifact. We have another question here, but I do want to introduce uh, Jack Wolfson, who's also at the same time one of our PhD students. Now you have a chance to ask a question. I have uh, three very, very, I promise something quick. Um, number one, um, I just want to point out, um, I mean, obviously we're all, well aware at this point uh, in this room the amount of passion that Lisa has brought to this project and what she brings uh, not only in terms of leadership and uh, bringing awareness to the public. So uh, thank you all for being a witness to that. Also, she's, as a part of the scheme, I can say that Lisa is tremendously generous in terms of giving credit. And she's been generous tonight in terms of give, giving me credit. That website is 99% the product of her and her team. I mean, it's very much student-centered, student-directed. It's really an amazing accomplishment. My small role, I was brought in very late to the project. I have only been with mission for a, a couple of years now. Um, the user's guide, most of that I wrote, I had a few small contributions to the uh, app and to the exhibit. But that's it, she's being very generous and kind of shifting the spotlight off of no. herself. But uh, that's very much- uh, No, the, the commission has been central to this, and the commissioners have been central to this. And, and, and I rely on Jake significantly because again, we do not want to trespass against the, the histories and the narratives and the stories of the Holocaust survivors and the people who were lost. And so Jake and, and people in the commission were really helpful in making sure that we stayed respectful. We did not want a simulation. We did not want to turn that into a spectacle. And uh, we didn't want to put the spotlight on the liberators in terms of celebrating America. Yeah. But there's a lot done, as we know, in terms of Hollywood. Yeah. We want to turn it into that kind of project. Second thing very quickly I'll say um, is this goes beyond the high school level, not just the college, but in the other direction. We know that there are younger students learning this, and so we don't want to bring young students into the camps. But for those of you from outside Texas, you might be surprised to know that the entire seventh grade public school curriculum for social studies is Texas history. So this is a way in terms of tying in 
their own communities, uh, American history, Texas history, and bringing in some awareness of the Holocaust. Though, of course, we don't want to put them in the campus. So. And in awareness of that, and with discussions with Jake, that's the reason why through the entire app you do not see a single body. Yes. And there's, the being in the app, there's a whole explanation, explanation. of that. Explain to students, this is not what it looked like. To the inmates, this is not what it looked like. Uh, to the liberators themselves, we used to fly over on a pretty day, it almost looks like a camp camp rather than a concentration camp. We're very explicit in terms of explaining that to students. This is now what we're doing. And finally, very quickly, at least I'm hoping you can say a bit about the other component of the project, which was a very moving ceremony to be directed uh, at the state capitol. Yes, so we also had a. For Crystal Knox. So we, we on, on the um, commemoration of Crystal Knox. We were actually in the Senate room of the Capitol in Austin, where we honored um, liberators and liberator families, and we had Holocaust survivors actually presenting medals that were commissioned by the, the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission that were presented. And then we actually had vintage World War II airplanes fly above the Capitol in broken man, in lost man formation. And so one of the airplanes actually went off um, uh, in, in, in uh, a symbolic gesture um, uh, move to honor those who were left behind. And so, um, and we are doing medallion ceremonies every place the exhibit goes. And so, the honor roll is an ongoing living thing. If, if um, you have anyone or any families or any information, the, the THGC is still collecting that information, and we will continue to update the honor roll as we move forward. I'm pleased that like everyone else, I was very impressed. At the beginning of your talk, you mentioned courses and textbooks. Is this, has this affected, or do you see it affecting changes in the books that we use in the high schools for the American history courses? Well, I would love to say yes. Um, but we, uh, I think, are, are all aware that um, the state commission that, that drives education is not necessarily peopled by educators. Um, and so we have, uh, so Matt Verdugo actually very eloquently just testified in front of um, one of the boards, the state boards, to argue for, uh, for, for not taking out certain genocides, for, for using certain types of languages, and, and very eloquently on behalf of um, historians, scholars, um, uh, humanists everywhere for the inclusion of this. So Pete Berkowitz was a powerful, those of you who know him, you did not say no to Pete Berkowitz. It's how I ended up with the project, right? <laughs> um, and Pete managed to not only go and change the cheeks and the stars so that in fact it was part of the curriculum, but again, it had to be through the lens of the liberation. It had to be through the lens of the liberators because it had to come through US history. But he did what was not possible. He actually flew to New York and met with the college board, right? And you know anybody who does AP classes, right? It is impossible to change the AP. Pete went and flew and met with everyone at the college board, and he got the AP US history changed to include questions about the Holocaust. So I think we're going to begin to see change. It's going to be slow, but but we're going to see more and more of it, and increasing amounts of it, of it actually appearing. Um, once you have the AP on board, once you have the TX on board, and remember, we're the state of Texas. We're big, right? And so if we start incorporating it, the textbooks actually follow us, right? If we print the textbooks, and because we buy so many textbooks, it gets distributed everywhere else. And so if we begin to change the narrative in our textbooks, it will start actually trickling through to the rest of the United States. Do we have another question here? Yeah. yeah, actually, on the last one, I've heard the same thing about Texas being a leader as far as books, textbooks. Absolutely. But um, I think you mentioned earlier, uh, what other states have Holocaust, I'm sorry. Is it on? I, I think my voice is projected. What, what other states have Holocaust commissions like Mexico? Matt or Jacob? Alabama, New Jersey, Tennessee, Illinois. Is it just a handful? Just Georgia. a handful. Yeah, yeah, it's just a handful. But it's not genocide, it's just Holocaust. But, but what the commission did that was so clever is that they not only sent a copy of the book to every single Texas state legislator, they actually sent it to Washington, D.C., right? And, and it, it, it's a way to ask, Texas, Texas has this. Why not you? You have to remember, though, that state commissions are very tenuous. And so we come up for Sunset Review when, Matt? 2021. 2021, right, which is the point at which the, the state the, the state of Texas will ask, right, is this commission worth keeping 
alive? Is it worth continuing to invest in this? And that's the reason why we've done a project like this, where it is not just about a few educators, not just, it is as broadly expansive as possible so that we can show the relevance across the state of Texas and beyond the state of Texas. And we got a letter from Laura Bush, who's the father's liberator. And we actually, uh, the, the opening letter in the Liberator book is from George H.W. Bush. Um, we actually have a second project now. It's a documentary that's being put out by KTTZ, which is Texas Tech Public Broadcasting. It should uh, be uh, debuted in the uh, fall of 2019, and it will be on uh, narratives of modern genocide. And it will go to Sundance, it will go to by South, South by Southwest. We're hoping that it'll end up on P PBS Point of View. Um, we're trying to make as large an impact as possible because this is the type of public scholarship that needs to work hand in hand with the academic scholarship um, to make sure that, that, that we're all moving forward together. Uh, two questions. First, um, has this gone out to all the private schools in Texas also? Or are you just going out to the ISDs? And secondly, what is the commission's relationship with TEA and ATA to adopt it? So it has gone out to the middle school and the high schools, and we've, got, we've uh, been consolidating a list of both public and private high schools. So uh, when, we, when Jake goes out and does his educator workshops, all the invitation goes out to the entire surrounding area, and the books have gone out to every public and private middle school and high school. We have not gone down to the elementary schools yet. Um, and I, I'm not sure that that would be appropriate. Um, the first time we begin to see this kind of discourse is actually in the middle school setting. Um, and we're very careful about the way in which we contextualize, verbalize the kind of language that we use. I have known some elementary school teachers who've introduced the concept through children's poetry and children's art. I never saw another butterfly um, is, is a, a perfect example of that. But, at, but for many of our elementary school, we, we want to be very careful that they have the maturity and they have the sense of civic responsibility to be able to handle this so that we don't traumatize uh, the younger children, but, um, but that they are outside. policy is that we do not educate elementary on the Holocaust. We do have our bullying. So I think Matt and Jake can respond about the THGC's connection to work with TEA. Could you repeat the question about TEA again? <laughs> yeah, the relationship. Relationship in it. Has TEA bought into this? To the Liberator Project or just yeah. the THGC in general? Well, TEA you know, sets educational policy right. for Texas curriculum. And sometimes they're um, short-sighted. <laughs> So currently, in the teaks, genocide is referenced in ninth grade world geography, and the Holocaust is referenced in the 10th grade world history, and 11th grade US history. That is the limitation of their buy-in right now. Although Jake has taught me over the last year that a lot of, a lot of education is being done in the English class. Most of it is not in the social studies. So, but the problem I have with that is I can't gauge the metrics on how many students are being taught you know, the diary and Frank or Knight or whatever, because teachers are free at the middle school level to choose from an approved list of books that are usually decided at the district level. So there's no way to really tell. Now, is TEA in? Sure, they're in based on what the teachers say, but it's very limited by in. Um, right now, I'm currently talking to some state legislators that want to expand Holocaust education by statute. And how that looks is yet to be determined, but they're envisioning an expansion of TEKS, where it's referenced in other subjects outside of social studies, with perhaps one driving force behind what is the main source of curriculum for the state. Perhaps it'll be our commission, perhaps it'll be a collaboration between the commission and museums. Um, all that's going to take funding, though. It's going to take a, a, a House member and a Senate member with a passion enough to co sponsor the bill. And it's complicated because in a state where the word mandate is a dirty word, in terms, especially if it's unfunded, um, it's, you don't want to put pressure on teachers to do something in their classrooms that they don't want to do or they feel pressure to do when there's such limited time already based on all the teaching standards that they have to go through 
the course of the year anyway. So more news on that yet to be determined. We'll see what it looks like down the road. We have any more questions? I think then we want to uh, thank again our wonderful speaker. I do want to thank our student ambassadors who once again have shown their abilities to have many transferable skills that came to our rescue tonight. So thank you again. And one last thing, the book is for sale outside. If y'all are interested in purchasing the book, it's twenty-two dollars, and you can buy it through your phone. Outside the room. Outside, outside the room. <laughs> thank you again, and have a safe trip home. Bye. 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 Bye.